Thank you, Father, for you are worthy. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we are walking through what we know is the book of Galatians, which really was a letter Paul wrote to the churches, plural, of Galatia. Now, in that, we started last week, we talked about how it began with Paul giving the defense and the, the, the argument for who he is. He's an apostle, not by the will or called by man, but because of that's what God had ordained and God, what God had set in place and said, you are an apostle. So he's making his defense that I am who I am because this is what God has set me out to be. And he starts out this letter with, with just this kind of astonishment going, and I cannot believe that you guys are so quickly have deserted the gospel message that I've come to you with. I mean, it's like, I don't know, maybe you uh, have parents, you probably have never experienced this before. Maybe you, you walk into your kid's room and you're like, hey, it's Saturday, we don't have a lot going on, so we're gonna clean a room. You're like, got it. And so they, I mean, they spring out of bed and they're like, this is the greatest day ever. Thanks mom, thanks dad for this you know, assignment. And they grab their dirty clothes, they, they put them in the, the washing machine and they're kind of organizing their stuff. You walk in there and you look and say, wow, you're really making some progress. This is great. And then somehow in the midst of their reorganization of the whole room, you walk in about 30 minutes later and their room is a disaster. Like what happened? Well, I got everything out and I just, you know, it became overwhelming. So I, I, I quit. I'm like, well, your room's messier now than what it started out with. Like, what happened? Like, I don't know, I, just, I gave up. And you're thinking, you started out so well. You were so motivated, but we have a bigger mess on our hands. That's kind of a little bit where Paul's at. Like, man, we started out so good and you guys understood the gospel and, and the churches were growing. They were thriving there in that Southern part of Galatia, you know, Antioch and Lystra. Like, things were going amazing. And now, what in the world? You guys have departed so quickly the gospel that has been entrusted to you. And uh, so, that's kind of how he started. So let's pick up here in, in verse 11. We're gonna read, uh, read and kind of break this up in chunks this morning. So in Galatians chapter one, starting in verse 11, for I would have, uh, would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to you by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul explains how he received this gospel and it did not line up traditionally how they were used to how things would be passed down or how they were typically taught. Paul says that he did not receive the gospel in the typical, normal way of receiving information or being trained. He received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this was a direct kind of a slap in the face or kind of a, kind of a moment to the Judaizers because they were constantly always sitting under different people and different teachers to learn. And that kind of, they prided themselves a little bit on, on who they would sit under or what they would do. And so uh, the Judaizers at that point that were like, what, what do you mean? You, it's, it's almost like, you know, a preacher comes up there and he's like, yeah, I, I haven't been to seminary. And like, oh, what? You're a pastor and you've not been to seminary? Like, man, the things I've learned, like, I just read from the scripture and the Holy Spirit. And like, but surely you've been to a Bible college. You know, like that's kind of how it's kind of taken this moment. And just for those, you know, people who are really caught up in that. Yes, I've been to college. Yes, I've been to seminary. So, you know, just like, but Paul's like, it, yeah, I didn't learn from man. I didn't go to some seminary, I didn't go to some Bible college, I didn't sit under this great professor, but I, I've, I've met people and, and, and pastor before. They're like, oh yeah, um, yeah, I, was, I went to this seminary and so-and-so, they, they were, you know, Dr. So-and-so, they were, they were my professor. I'm like, yeah, he was your professor and he was like 700 other people's professor that semester too. Like, like all of a sudden, because you took New Testament through this guy, like you must really be close to Jesus now kind of a thing. And that's kind of how these people were set up. That's kind of how they thought. And he's like, I, the gospel I preach to you, I did not learn it from a man. I did not learn it through oral traditions or passed down from generation to generation. I sat at the feet of Jesus Christ and it was revealed to me by him and him alone. So, this is kind of, you know, like contrary to how things were typically done, but Paul's point out the, the importance here, like what has happened and what God is doing is not just about, it's not about man's work. It's about, you know, what God is doing. So we pick up in verse 13 and 14. He says, for you've heard of my former life in Judaism and how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people, so extremely zealous, for I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my 
fathers. Well, how did they hear? You've heard of my former way of life. Well, maybe because when Paul came back through there, Originally, he explained about what his former life looked like and the fact that he was very zealous for the traditions of man and for the law, and, but he, you know, and, this, and he persecuted the church. Or maybe the false teachers that have come through there and got them to kind of shift from this other gospel, the one that was revealed by, by Jesus Christ to Paul to preach, this other one, this, this more of a works, and we're going to get these, to that in, in weeks to come. I don't want to jump ahead. But you know, it, maybe they were slandering him and saying, well, you know, why, how's this? he can't stand up there and teach y'all anything. Look, look at his past. Look what he's done. He persecuted the church. So Paul's saying, you know, you've heard of this, what's going on, but that's not really a matter of fact of who I am. And he's like, here's the thing. This is who I was and this is where I'm at. And what who I was, I was so zealous for the things of man. Church, I just want to let you know that Friday night was a great example of you being zealous for the things of the, of, of the kingdom of God. It was a great display of just your selfless generosity, investing in the lives of others. It was just absolutely embodied everything that we believe and what we're trying to accomplish here at this church. It was just absolutely amazing to be a part of. But Paul says, I was zealous not for the, those things. I was zealous for traditions of my father or traditions of the fathers, traditions of the law. So here's, here's the thing. I'll never forget, I was 20 years old on staff at a church and we had a meeting. We were on the auditorium and on our stage was these little mini pews. That's what I called them. So I was educated. They're not called mini pews, M-I-N-I pews. They're called deacon pews or deacon benches. I was like, oh. So as a 20 year old guy in the ministry learning things out, my next question was this. Why are they called deacon benches? Because no one sits on them, especially our deacons. Like maybe if for some reason the, the guy goes along in announcements, the worship guy may sit down a couple of times, but no one really ever sits on those. Why are they on stage? Well, they've always been there. So again, me being the, the young idiot on staff, I said, well, if we're needing more space on stage, or more space on stage for, the, for the, the worship team and that kind of stuff, why don't we just take them off and move them in the back? Everyone loves to sit in the back of a Baptist church. What if we just set them in the back? And of course, everybody went, that's a great idea, Paul. Which I went home from that day in the office like, babe, you will not believe this. They told me I had a good idea today. It was awesome. So we moved the little, the little deacon pews off to the back. We, uh, that was during the week. We come up Sunday morning for rehearsal for the, the praise team and all that stuff. And I'm there early to help out. And they're back on stage. I thought, <laughs> I was like, I asked the worship guy, I said, didn't we put those in the back? He goes, yeah. I said, well, he goes, well, help me move them back. I said, okay. So we pick them up. We move them back to the back. We set them down. It's like, okay, cool. We go through worship, rehearsal, all that kind of stuff. We go, we all go to the Sunday school. We come back for church and guess what? Yeah, y'all guessed it. They're back on stage. And I thought, huh. Then there's a deacon's meeting called. We need to have a deacon's meeting. Who keeps moving the deacon pews? So we go to the deacons meeting. We're having a conversation about who's moving the deacon pews. So me, again, being the, the young idiot, I'm like, well, we were trying to create more space, but you know, they're like, that's where they belong. Like, but no one sits in them. People would, could sit them in, in, in the back. And matter of fact, they're more comfortable than any other pew because no one sits in them. So the cushions are like fresh. It's kind of like the middle cushion in the couch. Everybody sits on the end. The middle seats always seems to be having a little more spring to it. And it was like, no, you're not. This, this person, as good intending as they were, were zealous for deacon pews being on the stage. Church, I just want to let you know, there's a lot of things we can be zealous for in church. Here's what I would love for us to be zealous for. Things of the kingdom. Zealous for Jesus. And, and Paul says here, he's like, man, I was so passionate about the wrong things. But no one could hold a candle to my passion because I was, I was advancing beyond everyone my age. I was so zealous for the traditions of the father's. I was so zealous for things that didn't have eternal value. Guys, I can tell you Friday night was a display of our church being zealous for the things that do matter. I've had multiple people come up to me today and say, you know, someone is even like, brand, hey, we're brand new to the church. We're just visiting. We're not even members, but we showed up because we thought that was a great idea. Got to sit next to one of the family members and explain, I don't really know a whole lot about the church, but I'm here and this is great. And it was just an amazing experience. It's an amazing thing to do. And so Paul says, 
you know, this is what is happening. This is my part of my life. But he noticed, he says, the church of God. If you, if you look at that and you were looking in Greek, that word church was what we kind of typically say, capital C church, like we're Boulevardy Baptist church, but then there's the global, you know, church of God. That word church in Greek is ekklesia. It's actually two words that can create one word in Greek. Ekklesia means ek, and I'm going to get the other one, kaleo, which means to call. One is to out of, and one is to call. So basically, ekklesia means those who are called out. Think about that one. Now you see when we end our services, we say you're sent because we're called out. The church, the ecclesia, we're called out. We're the called out ones. So that being said, when Paul says, you know, here's what's happening. Here's, I received this, not a relation of Jesus Christ, or, or, or received this through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And you've heard of my former life and I was zealous for the wrong things. Now let's look at verse 15. But when he had set me apart before I was born and called me out by grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach among the Gentiles. We'll stop there for a second. When you see the word but in the New Testament, almost always I look at that as God at work. It says here, you know, I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, God was at work, but God was at work. For the wages, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. When you see that word but in the, in the New Testament, it is most always looking and you say, God was at work here. God is at work. He's doing something, but God. So now you, you may read that and kind of go, all right, hold on a second. He set me apart before I was born. He called me by his grace. Was, he was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach among the Gentiles. What? That, that sounds a little confusing to me. It's, it sounds like, you know, like it's already set in stone. Like Paul didn't have a choice. There's no free will. I thought man had free will. And um, here's, here's a little, little side note theology lesson this morning. I believe all mankind is corrupt and is in need of a savior. No one can save themselves through their own works, nor do I believe anyone is pre-saved prior to birth. God loves all mankind is made for all of them a way to come to know him. God loved the world that he gave his only son, that anyone or whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God loves everyone and has made everyone to know him. He's given out that call for people to know him. Some will reject that message, that invitation of salvation. Some will accept that invitation of salvation and some will do it and yet still struggle and, and live in rebellion or because of their pride or lack of faith. You say, well, Paul, if God knows everything and yet we still have the opportunity to choose, how, how do those things kind of coincide that? That's made my brain hurt. Can I just be honest with you today as your pastor? It makes my brain hurt too. But this is how I've come to kind of rationalize or understand or kind of get hold on something that is bigger than, than me. And it's supposed to be bigger than me because it's, it's God and of God. Yesterday, I'm sitting down flipping through the channels. And I was like, oh, finished watching the Smith Valley game. And uh, so I flipped through the channels. And I'm like, oh, the Cowboys are playing. Sweet. I'm gonna watch Cowboys. Now, how my wife knew this, I don't know. But she was, huh, I thought they played last night. Like I'm the dude in the house. Like I'm supposed to know when the Cowboys play, right? Nope. I'm like, oh, cool. They're playing on Saturday afternoon. Watching the Cowboys game. My wife said, no, I think they played last night. So I look up, I'm like, oh, they did. And they won 27 to 26, huh? And I look at the score and I'm like, obviously a lot's fixing to happen. The fact that I had knowledge of how the game would end the fact that I had knowledge of what would happen, you know, the fact that so-and-so was gonna have four interceptions in one game, the fact that I had all that information did not change that those players still had free will while they played the game. God knows everything that's going on. He is, he is in control of all those things. He is, nothing happens without his, uh, his understanding or his knowledge. But that does not mean that in those moments that we lack free will in that moment. So just because I knew the outcome of the game and I knew someone's gonna have, you know, throw four interceptions did not change the fact that those things were still happening in a moment of free will. I just had knowledge outside of 
the current reality in that moment. And God is being infinite is outside of time, space, and, and matter. So if you ever had those moments, you're like, hey, how does this work? Feel free to use that or feel free to email me and tell me that made no sense and we'll have coffee this week and because I'll probably be like, you're right, it didn't. Let's talk more, you know, because there are things about the Lord that just are complex and that's okay to wrestle with. But that's kind of how I, I rationalize those, those things in, in together. So look at 16, picking up there again, the last part of 16, he says, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia, and return to Damascus. So why is Paul making the claim about his travel schedule? It, it, you know, see, what, what's in debate here? Well, the reason why Paul spent three years in Arabia, we don't know the exact, like who he met with. I mean, he's made it clear. He's not, he's not meeting with man. Man's not teaching him things. It's strictly revelation through Jesus Christ. But he had some time to kind of grasp some things. Now let's go back to who Paul was. Paul was very zealous for the things of the fathers, the law. He was an absolute uh, 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 scholar of the, of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He, was, he would knew those things well, backwards and forth. So as he has been revealed who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and has received the free gift of salvation, now he's probably figuring out, okay, this is what I know the law says, and this is what Christ has done. I know they're not in opposition, so how do they connect? Look, look at this verse real quick in Deuteronomy 21, 23. It's on your screen. Paul would have known this verse like by memory. It says, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land, uh, your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Paul would have understood. He was like, wait a second. Jesus Christ, he came, he lived, he died on a cross. He was hung on a tree. But Deuteronomy tells me that any man who is, hangs on a tree is, is cursed. Paul's like, how do, I, how do I reconcile that? Spending time with the Holy Spirit, God speaking to him, showing him things, not by man, but the Holy Spirit speaking to him. And if you were flip. A couple chapters, we'll look at this in a little bit. But Galatians chapter 3, 13, which is why you see Paul write this. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. See, Paul came to this understanding through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that anyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. But Christ has come to set us free. He has come to share and to take on our iniquities so that we should be free. He, he came and redeemed us from this curse by becoming a curse so that we can be redeemed. During these three years, Paul is taking the message of who Jesus is and he's not saying, oh, Old Testament, that was Old Testament, that doesn't fit. He's going, this is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a scholar of the Old Testament, I'm a scholar of, the, of these books and, and what, what, the, what was the law was at and, but then I know what Jesus has done and how he's come to reconcile and set me free and give me the Holy Spirit and live eternally in me. How does what God's word already said here line up with what God is already doing? And so during those three years, I believe Paul was spending time over and over in prayer with the Holy Spirit because he comes back and says, remember, I didn't sit down with any man. I didn't go to some seminary. I did not learn this from some guy. God himself has revealed this message to me. And that's the message that I'm preaching to you. Verse 18 says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas or, or Peter and remained with him for 15 days. So he goes and visits Peter with him for 15 days. Perhaps he wanted to talk to him more about, you know, what Jesus had done and someone who's walked with Jesus. Oh, we really don't know. What we do know is this. After three years, he went and spent 15 days with Peter. So anything that's probably elaborated in depth after that is just kind of, hypothesis. Peter did walk with Jesus. Paul did have an encounter with Jesus. Maybe that conversation's about, about that. Who knows, but it was, there was 15 days. He moves on pretty quickly from that. He says, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. He says, then I went into the region of Syria and so, Cilicia, 
and was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. Paul's continued to make the statement that these things that I'm teaching, I'm not passing around human traditions. I'm not telling people the things that are important that are outside what Jesus says most important. The things I wanna be zealous for are the things of the Holy Spirit. I wanna be zealous for the things of the Lord, not the things I used to be zealous for. And so don't think that my time away that I sit there and learn a bunch of things, I'm just passing down man's tradition. What I'm giving to you is that a revelation for who Christ is and what is shown to me, and that is what I'm giving to you. Now, it's not uncommon to give oath, to give it away. It's kind of like what we'd say, like, you know, cross my heart, hope that I stick a needle in my eye. Like, like, I'm telling you the truth. Like, I swear in my mama's grave, like that kind of thing. Like, it's not uncommon at that time for, for a person to, to give those kinds of like, and, and I am not lying, or I give an oath, or I make an oath to you. Paul is making, going out of his way to let people know that this message, this gospel he's preached is not from man. The reason why is because the other gospel that has been preached was completely fabricated by rules and laws and by man. And we'll get into that in, in the coming weeks. Verses 23 and 24, he says, they were only hearing it said, he used to persecute us and now he's preaching the faith and he once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of me. Paul states that they didn't know much about him other than what had been previously known. And as a result, because of what he were, was Paul's life and where he's at now, he said, they praise God. They were praising God because of, because of my testimony. So what's your takeaway? If you have your bulletin, um, you can flip on the back. We'll go through these um, fairly quickly. Verse 12, again, it reads and says, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Good news is received. Good news is received. You can't share what you don't have. If you come up to me today and ask me for $15, I could probably help you out. If everyone in here asks me for $15, you're gonna be in line for a long time. You can't share what you don't have. The good news, the gospel, it's been received. So I ask the question is, have you received the gospel message? Have you received the good news? Or have you kind of been putting it off because you realize that this good news doesn't, for you, it doesn't seem so good because of what you would have to change. You know of what the Lord would require for us. And so to you, it's, you don't think the risk is worth the reward. And can I just tell you, it absolutely is. Because if you're seeking to gain your life, you will lose it. But if you will lose your life there, you will find it. Good news is received. Verses 16 and 17, he says, I was pleased to reveal the son to me in order that I might preach to him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem with those who were the apostles before me. I went away to Arabia and returned to Damascus. Once the good news is received, it must be delivered. Once the good news is received, it must be delivered. I, I'm friends with a lot of you guys on social media. And I love it because I always can tell you when great things happen in your life because you're always posting about it. Look at this flounder. Look how awesome it is. Oh my gosh, it looks amazing. You know, hashtag, you know, I don't know. Forget the seafood down restaurant in New Braunfels I capped on a couple weeks ago. But anyways, we always know these good things that happen in our life because we share about it. When you get that exciting news, when you've been accepted at that college, when you get that promotion at work, you share it. But we're not talking about good news in this temporary life. We're talking about the good news. Jesus has redeemed our soul. He's made us new. He's wiped away our sin and called us sons and daughters of the king. Good news is received, but once it's received, it, it must be delivered. Our pastor friend, Scott Weatherford says, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found food or where I found bread. And I love that. I'm just, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found bread. I don't have it all figured out. But here's what I do know. I found bread. It's kept me alive, and I'll tell you, tell you where I got it. But you got to go on your own. You get, I'll walk you there, but you, it's, it's for you. I can't eat for you. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where I found bread. Church, if we've received the good news, I can tell you that the responsibility, the calling for us as followers of Jesus is to share the news. Once it's received, it must be delivered. 
The other thing is this, verse 24. And they glorified God because of me. After good news is delivered, it glorifies God. After good news is delivered, it glorifies God. I love Matthew 5, 16. I quote several times throughout um, preaching, which is let your light shine before men. Let them see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Many of us will already talk ourselves out of not doing things because we already know the results. Well, I don't wanna, I, I can't invite the church. They're busy this weekend. I'm not gonna, you know, do that because I already, I already know the answer to that. I'm not gonna bring that up because I already know the answer. We, we, we so many times talk ourselves out of following with what God is because we, we already know what the end result is gonna be and so we don't do it. It's not our job to figure out the results. Once we receive the good news, it's our job to deliver it. And I promise you, when you deliver it, it glorifies God. John and I were talking between services and he's like, you know, you, you take this humble approach and, and you, you read that, it kind of makes your, you know, your, your humble radar go up and you know, read verse 24 by itself. And they glorified God because of me. I mean, you could read it that way. They glorified God because of me. No, here's the thing. Yes, they glorified God because of Paul. But here's the thing. Paul says, this is, this is where I was. Yeah, you've known my former life. You know what I used to do. And I was zealous for all the wrong things. I was more passionate about Deacon pews than I was telling everyone about Jesus. I was more passionate about the things that don't really matter than the things that are, have eternal matter. That, that was me. And look, God has changed my life. And then I spent three years just sitting at the feet of our creator. So I could give a message that wasn't learned and, and, and messed up by, by man's interpretation just from God himself. And that's the gospel message I've delivered to you. And they, they, they knew my former life and they seen the transformation. It says here in verse 23, they said, he used to persecute, persecute us and is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they worship, they praise God because of him. Church, this good news we've received, once we receive it, it's our job to deliver it. But when we do, people will, re will rejoice because of it. Not because you're going around saying, well, this is why I've messed up and this is my former way of life. They will, they will hear that message. What they'll hear is, but God. Yeah, I, this, this, and this, but God. And when I, when, I, when I say that, but God, God is at work. Church, when's the last time we shared our but God story with someone? When's the last time we sat down with someone and said, you know, this is what was going on. And when I thought it was all was lost, but God. Let your light shine before men, that they would see your works and it would glorify your Father in heaven. Church, Paul's trying to get a hold of this church in Galatians because they had received this gospel message and were living it out, and somehow so quickly they deserted, they got off task and picked another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but they picked it. And Paul's trying to get them back on track. He's trying to draw them back to the things that matter most. And this was his life. Church, this week, I want to encourage you. The good news you've received, deliver it to someone. And don't, don't expect them to pray the prayer of salvation. Don't expect them to come to church with you next week. Don't expect them to sell all their goods and give you know, to the poor. And you know, don't expect this, just deliver the message. Don't, don't deliver with expectation, deliver with anticipation. Just, but God. So let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that every one of our stories look totally different and yet you will all, Use the, you can use them all powerfully if we would just open our mouths. I can't imagine the obstacles that the Apostle Paul had to jump through of everyone knowing what his life used to be and then having to combat reputable people most likely in those communities trying to defraud who he was and the work that you had done in his life. But yet the Apostle Paul knew that you were still at work in him and you're working through him. God, you are still at work in us and you're working through us. Thank you for this local ecclesia, this local group of men and women, boys and girls who are 
sent out or set apart. Lord, as we leave this place, let us be sent under the direction of the Holy Spirit. We'll live a life that honors you above all things. It's in your name we pray, amen. Church, if we can pray with you about anything down here at the front, it'll be some deacons and myself. We'd love to meet you. Maybe you're visiting the church and you want a little bit more information on what that looks like. We'd love to talk to you. Or maybe you have a question about salvation or baptism. As everyone's dismissing, you guys can come down and talk with us. We'd love to meet with you and pray with you. You're sent and have a blessed and wonderful week.